All right, what's going on, class? This is your professor, Dr. J.S.K. Austin, and welcome to week number seven. That is right, week number seven of your 9407 class, which is Intellectual Freedom and Its Discontents. Uh, I'm going to keep this check-in video also pretty brief. We don't have uh, too much that we have to address in the class right now. The discussion prompts are still going great. I will say that you all are, um, try to do it civilly. I've noticed that you guys are very, very nice. So try to do it civilly, but you guys are, and when I say guys, by the way, I do mean people of all genders. Um, maybe that's just some East Coast slang, but I'm not specifically referring to males. Uh, maybe I should say y'all, like a true Southerner does. So, um... Let me just say, y'all are allowed to engage one another in disagreement, just do it civilly, um, because I've noticed that you all are doing a fantastic job with your discussion posts, uh, better than I would have predicted, better than I would have expected and hoped, and I'm very happy to see what I am seeing. However, um, it does seem like there might be some reluctance for you all to civilly disagree with one another. And um, let me just say that when you start talking to librarians, especially, let me just, I'm just going to keep it real. I'm going to tell it like it is. Librarians, a lot of them ain't going to do squat face to face because I have been in this field for 14 years now and I've seen that. But librarians tend to have a whole lot of spine on social media. They will curse you out. They will drag your name. They will do it all. I mean, nobody is braver than a librarian on Twitter or in the ALA think tank group on Facebook. Those are some brave mothers shut your mouths when they are on their social media. Um, in person, let me just say I've confronted a few people at conferences who just weren't quite as brave, but... Either way, I'm not a confrontational person. I'm very conflict avoidant, actually. So maybe I should be the last one talking, but I'm just saying I'm not going to be cursing people out on Twitter either like I'm some badass. That's just not my role, um, you know, because where I'm from, stuff that starts on the Internet can end up in the streets. So I don't want to. So that's how I live my life. I'm not going to start anything on the Internet knowing that it can come on the streets for me. Uh, so that's how I roll. But having said that, um, yeah, a lot of, again, I'll just keep it real. A lot of librarians, they're very miserable people. They're people who had higher aspirations in life because they are very smart. We're a profession of very intelligent people. But we're a profession of very intelligent people who felt that they should have gone further in life than they did. Um, I meet a lot of librarians who were, you know, like top 5% of their high school graduating class, and they were National Honor Society and graduated magna cum laude and all this stuff. Um, and so I see a lot of disappointment. Uh, maybe that they, they're not willing to admit to, but I see a lot of librarians who had higher aspirations and then settled into librarianship. Now, and that's just not me. I was a very average, mediocre student. Um, I did make it into National Honor Society in high school, but I made it my senior year as opposed to my junior year. And I didn't go to a very good high school, so I probably did not have to work as hard to get there as a lot of people did. But I, I had like the minimum GPA that you could have to get in. Um, and then, yeah, I, I did not have cum laude anything um, in college. Uh, I graduated undergrad with a 3.2, which isn't terrible, but it's also not, you know, it's mediocre. You know what I'm saying? So um, I say that just to say, you know, I say that to say that a lot of librarians harbor a lot of deep, bad attitudes, and they will take that mess out on you 
especially on social media because they start feeling really froggy and they want to leap on social media and that's just how they roll. So um, be prepared. There are a lot of unpleasant people in our field and I would just um, like for you all to maybe, maybe even be pleasant in the face of unpleasantry. Um, you know, just, I think there's a way to disagree with people without just being an ass, you know, even if somebody, and I'll admit, um, and I'll, I'll use this as an example and I'm apologetic for it, but, uh, yeah, I'll bring this up as an example of when I was wrong, but when the reaction was just not what it should have been, but I believe that the person who called me on being wrong was also probably somebody who just had to be a internet warrior. Um, so again, I was wrong a few years ago. Um, this is probably about five or six years ago. I had, uh, I had referred to something, to an idea, um, that I, that somebody had advanced, uh, as in this, idea, by the way, was being universally panned. It wasn't just me criticizing it. It was a lot of people criticizing it. Um, and yeah, I, I regret this to this day, but I refer to that idea as retarded, something that I should not have said and something that I wouldn't say now that I'm older and wiser. Um, I don't use that R word anymore except to call myself out. Um, but, you know, it was something that, like, if if someone had used an inappropriate word around me like that, I would have just been like, hey, you know, you can say something other than that. But I had some librarian keyboard badass uh, respond with just all sorts of profanity and you will pick another word because blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, really? Because you would not say that shit in my face. And that's just how a lot of people in this profession just are. They are... um is one of my favorite rappers, Chameleon Air, said, you know, they're, uh, well, I won't say exactly what he said, but he said there's something in the winter and then they turn Jamaican in the summer. And that's just a way of saying, um, that's just really a way of saying, yeah, you're going to be this way when you're in my face. And then when you have the ability to have this keyboard protecting you or this space and this distance protecting you, then you were going to be, you know, extra and just extra. Um, so bringing it back, I'm just going to say, listen, uh, it is okay for you to engage your classmates in a healthy way. Now, do I want you all to curse each other out? No, absolutely not. Um, but are there civil ways to disagree and to explore um, differences of opinion. Absolutely. And I haven't seen a whole lot of that. And it's good that y'all are being nice to each other. I like it. But, um, also realize that particularly in online environments, in fact, I'm going to say exclusively in online environments, librarians are not going to be nice to you. They're going to be very nice to you when they're, uh, when there's a probability of them getting punched in the face. But aside from that, you know, they're going to take out whatever misery and frustration on you. And that's just how they roll. Um, so, yeah. And, you know, and I have seen some of you disagree with me in the discussion boards, and that's good. Um, you know, keep doing that. I don't have all the right answers. If I had all the right answers, I wouldn't be a teacher in Sicil, I would be the monarch of ALA. I would like, I would just be like, hey, I got all the right answers. So elect me president and then don't ever end my term because I have all the right answers. So I'm going to run a ALA and I'm going to take care of everything because I got the answers. But no, nah, that's not, you know, I'm, I'm someone with an opinion and someone, now I will say that I feel my opinions for the most part are informed uh, either by experience or by literature, but they're still opinions, okay? Um, so we are out of the First Amendment stuff for the most part. Now, this hate speech stuff actually does also deal with the First Amendment, 
But as far as the first and 14th Amendment modules that we were looking at in the limits on freedom of speech, we're pretty much uh, done with that. And you all, again, did a really good job with it. I know it's challenging because, uh, excuse me, I know it's challenging because, you know, we're not lawyers. Um, for the most part, there are a couple, but for the most part, we're not lawyers. So, you know, digesting law is not easy for us, but I think you all did it um, very competently and I could see some growth. I um, So one thing that I did was I compared some of the things some of y'all were saying in module one compared to what y'all were saying later on. And I do feel because in this, this is something that I don't think there's any literature that backs this up. But this is just anecdotal. My personal observation is that, yeah, I think that a lot of library school students are just First Amendment purists, like no censorship ever. And, you know, and all the marketplace of ideas has to include everything and all of this. And then when they start actually being exposed to real world dilemmas, then they're just like, OK, maybe maybe it's not as fluid as I thought this whole idea of no censorship ever. And I'm not really trying to advocate for censorship, even though I know that's what it sounds like right now. But what I am going to say, what I am going to say is that it's more complicated than just no censorship ever. That's my opinion. Um, Ideally, there will never be censorship. And I think that that is something that everyone believes. I think that everyone in this field has an ideal situation in their head of a society where censorship is never necessary. Um, but that is our ideal society. And I know a lot of you are not going to like this, OK, um, but I'm going to say it anyway. I think that this world falls short of being the ideal world. And because of that, we have to put in some regulations or stipulations or whatever that we don't want to. Um, because I would never want to filter, for instance, like when I was in public libraries for a year and a half, I worked at a public library as an adult services librarian. I would never want to filter um internet results i would never want to do it but i live in a world unfortunately that isn't perfect and so i do have to juggle with this idea of okay do i have to invoke a little bit of censorship here and filter these results for the safety of my community and i hate that um I would, uh, again, I know a lot of you probably wouldn't approve of this, but I'm going to tell it how it is. Um, I come from, people think that crack cocaine is just an inner city problem and it's not. Um, you will find crack houses throughout rural North Carolina in the, uh, in the black areas of rural North Carolina, which is where I'm from. And you'll find meth in these in opioids and the, those sorts of things and predominantly white rural areas in North Carolina just is what it is and there was or still is today there's a crack house in the same community that I grew up in um and yeah I would it, I've seen firsthand how crack cocaine can ravage a community and I um at the library, at the public library where I'm from, yeah, they do filter um, results that teach you how to manufacture crack cocaine on the internet. And I agree. Um, I know people might be thinking, hey, but what do people need to do research on how to manufacture crack cocaine? Well, those people are just going to have to ask <laughs> the librarian to lift the filter so that they can do that. Um, but no, it's, I'm, I'm not going to support it just being readily accessible because the knowledge of how to manufacture crack cocaine in my community 
has been more harmful than good to the people in my community. And I know that's going to be a very po unpopular opinion uh, for a lot of you in this library science program. But for me, a lot of times I look at it as a matter of human life and survival. Um, do people really need to freely be able to assess how to access how to cook crack cocaine? I don't believe so. Have I seen people lose things that they love due to crack cocaine? Hell yeah, I have. Um, I've seen people get, I mean, I've had like petty crimes against me. Like I've had like personal belongings stolen. I've had my car broken into and I'm sure it was crack, crackheads who did it or whatever. Um, but I've never lost anything of value as far as stuff with heavy sentimental value. Um, but I like I, a little girl in my neighborhood, someone stole her puppy. And I guarantee you it was somebody from that crack house. And that devastated that little girl. Think about a little girl who just loves her puppy and she lives in a rural area where there's not much to do, but she's got a puppy and somebody steals her puppy. I mean, it tore that girl up. And I've, and I've seen, um, I was a reporter in my hometown. I've, um, I've dealt with cases where people who were high on crack were, um, they put themselves in situations where they were, um, they ended up being victimized. I, I don't think, as far as I know, I can't recall any situation where someone was high on crack and committed a violent crime that I know of, but I've certainly seen people become victims because of the crack. Um, definitely, um, you know, especially when it came to some women who were uh, crack addicts in my community and you know, they put themselves in situations in order to get that fixed. They prostituted themselves and became victims of violent crime or murder, even that way. You can look up the Rocky Mount. Um, if you Google Rocky Mount prostitute murders in North Carolina, um, you'll probably that was that wasn't my county. That was an adjacent county, but it's still the same general area. And uh, yeah, there was a serial killer who killed, I think, at least 10 known crack addict prostitutes. Um, and these were women who, their sickness, their addiction, addiction is a sickness. And their sickness and vulnerability put them in situations where they were susceptible to violent crime and they became victims of violent crime. And so, no, I can't support not filtering results that teach you how to manufacture crack or teach you how to manufacture meth um you know because you can cook that shit pretty easily um a little bit of Sudafed and you're on your way um and I, yeah i just can't support that uh so that's my little ramble i did want to show y'all one other thing so i didn't my bad for failing to mention banned books week but we'll talk we've got a module on banned books and to be honest with you Banned books a week at this point kind of annoys me um, just because I do it every year. That's all. I mean, it's very, it's something that's very exciting for a lot of librarians. And I don't mean to take that from them because it is something, it's a way for us to engage our uh, communities. But for me, it's just kind of like, oh man, it's banned books week again. Uh, so it, it doesn't have the luster that it had when I was a newer professional, but I did want to show you all something okay so yeah this is what i wanted to uh talk about and i hope that you know discussions of race don't make you all too uncomfortable although i will say if they do you know kind of i don't know get more comfortable I, I i want you all to be comfortable with um not necessarily participating but just hearing like I'll be honest, and I think I said this before during the first sync session that we had with this class. Um, I'm not comfortable speaking, for instance, about uh, I'm not comfortable speaking a lot about gender because um, 
when it comes to sex and gender, I don't feel that I have anything to bring to the discussion. Um, so I'm not comfortable speaking, but I am comfortable listening. And in fact, I need to listen as much as possible. And the same with like um, LGBTQ plus um, issues and dilemmas. I'm cishet. Uh, and so I don't feel... I don't necessarily feel comfortable talking a lot about, um, you know, those, those types of issues because again, it, it, it doesn't affect me. Like I've never, my life has never in any way been othered or hindered due to my being het, you know, but having said that, um, you know, I'm still wanting to listen and I'm wanting to hear, you know, the right, uh, the right things, the things that, uh, I'm wanting to hear the things that make people the safest and that validates the humanity of all these people, regardless of, you know, sexual preference or gender identity. Okay. So, um, Again, if you're if you're not comfortable discussing race, I hope you're at least comfortable being engaged on it. So this is something uh, that I would uh, that I saw regarding Dan Books Week on Twitter that I just felt that I had to just show um, because I kind of liked it. So happy Dan Books Week. These are the most banned books from public libraries and schools in the U.S. And we've got To Kill a Mockingbird, which, you know, it, it, it most of us, I think, have probably read To Kill a Mockingbird. It does deal with race um, very heavily. Uh, Catcher in the Rye, of course, Huck Finn also deals heavily with race. Um, Slaughterhouse-Five, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, uh, Lord of the Flies, Animal Farm, Scarlet Letter, 1984, and Fahrenheit, 451. And a librarian um, discussed, hey, there are some great books in this picture, and the pal is as white as could be. Uh, for a book to be banned, it usually has to be assigned first. So I'll say, I'll say a few things about this, and then I will end the video, because I didn't realize I was going to talk for 25 minutes tonight. Um... Yeah, the, uh, with the banned books reports that you all are doing and the two that I've gotten so far, they've been excellent. Um, there are some books written by people of color in um, in those listings. I can't remember everyone who's a person of color, but I know I've got Toni Morrison. I know I've got Salman Rushdie, uh, and I think I've got a few others. So... Uh, yeah, I, I will keep it real here and just say that uh, the most banned books are the books that I think are, you know, these are the assigned books and the assigned books in our traditional education system a lot of times are uh, books that have been written by white people. And actually, most of these are white men. Uh, I mean, of course, Harper Lee is not a white man. Um, pardon my ignorance, but I I can't. <laughs> Y'all are gonna rip me for this and be like, "Whoa, how does Doctor Jace not know this?" But I don't know if JD Salinger is male or female, to be honest with you. But anyway, um, these are definitely white authored uh books, even though they, you know, at least for especially for To Kill a Mockingbird and Huck Finn. Uh, they deal very heavily with race, but they're still, I guess, books that are authored by white authors. Um, and so I see the need for um, assigning materials that aren't uh, assigning materials even in K-12, not just at the college level, that are materials that were written by people of color or that were written by women or that were written by uh, people who fall into um, LGBTQ identity, pl L LGBTQ plus identities, uh, also people who are differently abled. So 
um, you know, I would, the, this tweet just kind of struck a chord with me and I appreciate it that somebody had, you know, the fortitude to say this and, um, yeah, so I will leave it at that. Uh, again, you guys are doing a, you all are doing a wonderful job. Y'all are doing a wonderful job. I need to just say y'all. It is actually the most inclusive thing that you can say is y'all. And I do say y'all when I'm back home, but for some reason in the Midwest, I've trained myself not to say it. Uh, but yeah, y'all. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, y'all are doing a fantastic job on these discussion boards. Um, the midterms did go well. I apologize for the snafu that occurred with those, but the midterms overall have been very good. And um, yeah, I look forward to what you all will continue doing for the rest of the semester. So having said that, I am Dr. Jace and keep on keeping on, uh, you know, quarantine in place if you need to. COVID is still going on. Hopefully we'll have a cure soon. Take care, folks. Till next week.